Hello everyone. You are watching scardia.com. Have you ever had a back pain? And if you are a young male, like guy who is 18, 19 years old and has having a back pain, what really comes to your mind? Mostly muscular pain, isn't it? Most of the time, yes, it does. But unfortunately, the disease I'm going to discuss is the most misdiagnosed disease. As at times, it takes around eight to ten years. especially in case of young females to properly get diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis because most of the time the initial symptom is back pain and patients only keep on getting treated for mechanical and myofascial back pain so we'll be going through the general aspects epidemiology causes risk factor ankylosing spondylitis is one form of the axial spondyloarthropathy axial means it's affecting the center axis of the body that is mainly it affects the spine and sacroiliac joints it's a generalized chronic inflammatory disease it affects in spine and sacroiliac joints as i just told you and the pain and stiffness of the back with variable involvement of the hip and shoulder we are the uh, mostly these are the initial symptoms but remember shoulder and hip and knees are the peripheral joints they are usually not affected first as it is axial spondyloarthropathy the first thing which gets affected is the spine and the sacroiliac joint coming to the epidemiology if its reported prevalence is about 0.1 to 0.2% in western europe and northern america much lower in japanese and african people i will let you know why males are affected more frequently than females as almost 2 is to 1 in certain and in certain studies it came out to be 10 is to 1 so in different uh, study groups uh, all but on the whole on average males are affected actually more and the reason there is increase incidence in western europe and north american as compared to japanese and african people is due to the presence of a gene called called as hla b27 locus this is the responsible because when the genetic analysis of uh, the genomes of western european north american descent were done you will found out that due to this presence of this gene they are genetically more predisposed to developing ankylosing spondylitis as compared to japanese and african people usual age of onset is between 15 to 25 years so that is the reason this is a very active age group patients usually are very active especially if in case of males they are always uh, the result is the first thing which comes to your mind when a young 18 19 or 20 year old comes to you with a history of back pain that is probably it's something of related to mechanical back pain very rarely because uh, uh, for diabetes doctors usually thinks of ankylosing spondylitis straight away as a result the unfortunate reality is it takes sometimes 2 to 3 years in some studies it took even 8 years before the diagnosis especially if there was a young female who developed mechanical back pain or who developed back pain only and stiffness gradually and it is very slow progress to disease and it really slowly progresses as a result sometimes it's very difficult to diagnose early on until unless it has progressed to an extent that it gives other symptoms also starts to appear and it can be diagnosed genetics the most important point in this is hla b27 now the human leukocyte antigen and major histocompatibility complex type 2 is an always involved in this and if you see on the right side over here this is a normal curve there is a lordosis then kyphosis and then again lordosis of the lumbar spine you know this will lordosis uh, disappears first it becomes straight and then it becomes actually kyphotic now there is already a natural kyphosis at thoracic spine this results due as there is a vertebral collapse this results in hyper lord hyper kyphosis resulting in increased kyphosis at the thoracic spine similarly the lordosis initially it disappears and the cervical spine becomes straight then as you can appreciate over here instead of having a c shape over here like this it has actually become kyphotic there is increased kyphosis of thoracic spine and in this you can appreciate that lumbar spine lordosis has disappeared but as the disease progresses eventually the even the lumbar spine becomes lordotic strong tendency to familial aggregation associated with genetic markers that is hla b27 erap1 
Now coming to the pathogenesis, what actually happens in enclosing spondylitis? As you know, it's an itis. Spondylitis means definitely there will be some degree of inflammation. It's common in family members of the patient than in general population. Which it is usually seen that if your uh, relationships, like for example, your mother, father, or your siblings, or any one of them was affected, there is increased genetic predisposition in that case, and there is results of getting ankylosing spondylitis actually markedly increased. Actually, B27 in over 95% of Caucasian patients and 50% of first degree relative. Now, once the study was done, whether this was present in it, and those who developed ankylosing spondylitis, they almost had 95, 75% of them have HLA B27 antigen present. And in those uh, patients who developed ankylosing spondylitis, when their relatives were also tested, 50% of those relatives were found out to be HLA B27 positive, although they have not developed the disease yet, but there is increased chance of them developing the disease. Racial groups with unusually low prevalence of AS also shown to be very low prevalence of HLA B27. As I've mentioned just in the previous slide, the Japanese and North African population have a very low uh, prevalence of AS. The reason is they have a very low prevalence of HLA B27 in their genome. So what is the triggering factor? What actually starts ankylosing spondylitis? Why can't all those usually have present but they still don't get it and those because on average it's 0.1 to 0.2% that actually means almost 1 or 1 to 2 in 1000 people who get it. What about the other 998 people who still have HLA B27 positive but they have no AS? Well the triggering factor is basically this is a theory that is a bacterial antigen which resembles HLA B27 induces an antibody response. It's kind of a theory where the infection has occurred. Now the antibodies has been released and against that antibodies, once the response has been mounted, this results in it. Uh, all those cells who contain HLA B27 epitope will be targeted mainly and that includes, then you know this is what happens. If there was initially antigen which contained HLA B27, it came in, body recognized it, mounted in response. Once the next infection comes in or further antigen comes in, there will be higher amount degree of response against those. This results in all our immune system get activated. We have antigen presenting cells which actually present this antigen to T cells. Once T cells get sensitized, they actually further sensitize as well and results in mounting of an immune response. Now this results in actually the synovial cells who actually uh, have HLA B27 like epitope on the surface are actually affected most. This, this inflammation eventually spreads towards giant and usually is then resulting in synovitis and inflammation uh, of inflammation of the joint. And why it is called association with ulcerative colitis and bladder function because usually the, it is either the gut or the bladder infection which was actually the trigger that uh, infective LA, uh, organism contained actually B27 for against which this antibodies uh, were made and this is in sensitization of the immune system which later on started affecting the synovial tissue and the synovial joints. The basic lesion is actually two things synovitis, synovitis that is the inflammation of the synovium inflammation of the fiber osseous junction of the syndesmotic joint tendon. Now what happens is that once this sensitization and immune reaction has taken place, all those cells who are uh, actually uh, resemble this HLA B27 epitope actually are targeted, which we mainly include the synovium, that is the synovial cells, which are mainly present in the synovial joints, while other cells include the, the cells in the fiber osseous junction of the syndesmotic joints. For example, syndesmotic joints are mainly the spinal joints. These are mainly affected. That is why this is a form of an axial spondyl arthropathy that it affects spine and sacroiliac joint mainly. But as synovial joints are present in the periphery of the body as well, like knee, like hip, like elbow, so it can affect other joints as well. Now, this is on if you see it over here, uh, 
Now, this is a normal X-ray and this is an X-ray of a patient with ankylosing spondylitis. The reason I'm mentioning it is now this is an X-ray pelvis. As you can appreciate, this is the hip joint. This is the hip joint of this side. This is the sacroiliac joint as you can appreciate over here. But what about the sacroiliac joint over here? I cannot see any line or any joint space between this side of the right sacroiliac joint some degree of joint space but it's markedly reduced in case of the left as well so that means you know the most affected organ is sacroiliac joint and spine itself and sometimes this is the reason of the stiffness as well because in during flexion and extension this joint is once gets ankylosed patient is actually become so stiff that he or she cannot bend forward and bend backwards which actually is more problematic and due once the ankylosis sets in that the joints have become completely ankylosed then there will be no degree of movement or very little degree of movement at the joints so <clears throat> synovitis of the sacroiliac and vertebral facet joints cause destruction of the articular cartilage and periarticular bone costal vertebral joints sometimes get infected are frequently involved leading to diminished respiratory excursion now in case of the patient is an old age this is highly problematic because they were already have some degree of fibrosis of the lungs and respiratory compromise of compounded by costovertebral joints uh, arthritis resulting in highly diminished respiratory effort now what happens is there's an inflammation of fiber osseous junctions which affects mainly the spine then it escapes on and from there it goes to intervertebral discs then it goes into the sacroiliac ligaments and sometimes it also affects the symphysis pubis now if you see the anatomy there are all these joints are actually present in the center of the body costal vertebral joints then at the back there are the joints of the back which is actually the intervertebral discs the sacroiliac joint ligament and symphysis pubis in front that is why it is called as axial spondyloarthropathy and it also may affect the manubrium sterni and the bony insertion of the large tendons. Asthenopathy, there is an element of asthenitis and asthenopathy as well in ankylosing spondylitis. Now coming to the stages of the disease. Initially, it's the inflammatory reaction with cell infiltration and granulation tissue formation and erosion of the adjacent bone. Then it's a replacement of that bone with granulation tissue to fibrous tissue. Once the fibrous tissue is formed, then there's ossification of the fibrous tissue leading to ankylosis of the joint. If you see the most common, it's the effect is the area of the lumbosacral spine, the sacroiliac joint and the pelvic area. So on the right side, this is a normal lumbosacral spine uh, lateral view. If you see it over here, can you appreciate normal intervertebral disc spaces compared to this side? There is bony erosion which is occurring and there is a fibro osseous junction is actually resulting in this kind of a pattern because there is increased ossification. First there is a collapse of the bone on these edges, then the fibrosis, then leading to further ossification. So this is a result of ankylosing spondylitis. Similarly, if you see it over here, anteriorly the vertebrae appear concave. If you see this slightly concave but on this they have almost flattened out this concavity is actually also lost there's increased ankylosis at the fibrosis complex and syndesmotic joints resulting in decreased space and there's actually a decrease in the volume of the intervertebral discs then compounded by sclerosis and uh, of the posterior spinal column as well resulting in increased stiffness and decreased movement at the spinal cord now this is an example of advanced uh, stage of ankylosing spondylitis similarly if this is a normal x-ray you can appreciate sacroiliac joint on both sides and uh, hip joints on the both sides but if you see this x-ray you cannot appreciate any joint bilaterally in the both hips Similarly, both joints are not sacroiliac joints are completely ankylosed. 
Now in this kind of a patient, patient will not be able to squat, will not be able to bend forward, bend backwards because his, uh, his spine and hip and sastaf has run. So that is an important point that you need to restore the movements. The normal daily activities like shoe tying, like bending forward to pick up something, uh, that is, becomes impossible for the patients. So it's actually highly deteriorating disease because there's decreased movements resulting in cumbersome situations where patients is just unable to help him or herself to carry out the daily activities of life. Thank you very much. Keep watching scardio.com.